Hello, everybody. Uh, it's six o'clock and it's time for tonight's book talk, the second in um, a kind of thematic pair that look at the social history of American hotels, in particular New York hotels. This is a little bit of a shift from our usual um, concentration on architecture and urbanism, but it certainly collect, connects to um, views on the history of architecture in cities that look especially at the um, social history and the building as a, a site of, uh, of social, um, social theater in effect um, with the hotels, the Waldorf Astoria that um, David Friedland talked about just last week. Um, and now tonight, Paulina uh, Bren, who is a professor at Vassar, professor of gender studies and media studies, as well, of, as, well as international relations, uh, who has brought um, academic chops in terms of the research on her subject, the Barbizon Hotel, a, um, a legendary uh, women's residence uh, in New York that opened in 1928, um, but really um, had decades worth of influence uh, in the, um, not, not the life of the city, but um, not just the life of the city, but um, in particular, the, um, the as her subtitle um, suggests, the hotel that set women free and the kind of liberation of careerism of, and of um, urban, uh, urban participation um, and in the theaters uh, in, and in the arts um, that the Barbizon facilitated for so many new arrivals to the city. And that's the story that Polina is going to tell. Um, we're also joined tonight by and Andrea Barnett, who is a, a writer and especially a biographer who has written books on, uh, well, in particular, one that you can hear her discuss uh, in a lecture that she gave about three years ago at the Skyscraper Museum called Visionary Women, um, how, and that looks at, um, at three, key figures from the 1960s, Rachel Carson, Jane Jacobs, um, well, actually four, Jane Goodall and Alice Waters um, with a biographical frame, but also thinking in terms of um, the influence of women on our culture. And so I thought it would be interesting tonight to pair these two feminist writers and, um, and in a sense, biographers, one the kind of biography of the building and uh, another biographer who focuses in particular on the careers of women um, in order to have a dialogue. So the shape of uh, this evening is after I share my screen uh, with a few images of the Barbizon from the 1920s when it went as a, a brand new building on um, the Manhattan skyline, uh, then Paulina will do a, a short presentation of about um, 15 or, or um, 20 minutes and then Andrea will um, join us on the screen. In fact, I will leave the screen because I am inviting you to pose your questions in the chat box and I will moderate those. So the dialogue will be between Paulina and Andrea um, and I will um, join at the very end. So after I show you this series of slides, um, I will invite Paulina to turn her camera on and come onto the screen and I'll leave and she'll share her screen then. Um, so, uh, well, here is the cover of Andrea's book, Fierce of Visionary Women. And uh, again, you can find on our, our website um, her delightful lecture that she gave a few years ago. Um, I just wanted to recall what we talked about last week with David Friedland was the geography of hotels um, in the early part of the 20th century, and indeed the, the late 19th century. And I'm showing you with your, my cursor, if you can see it, the Waldorf Astoria in his, its first location, which was on 34th, between 33rd and 34th on Fifth Avenue. And then of course, um, moved uptown to the Art Deco um, uh, mountain uh, that you see on Park Avenue in the middle of the screen. I think everybody knows what the Waldorf looks like. Um, in the skyline of New York that was developing so energetically in the 1920s. And again, with my cursor, I'm gonna show you the um, Shelton Hotel in the background that I'll talk about in a moment because these skyscrapers of the Upper East Side of which the Barbizon was one, were creating a new landscape of modernity in the city. 
um, the train tracks covered over that, that went into Grand Central provided whole new territories for these skyscrapers that um, rose uh, to uh, house office workers in some of the towers that you see, like the Chrysler building and the GE building, um, but also in these giant hotels um, that were for tourists, but were also for residents. Um, and as Polina will describe, that's the case with the Barbizon. Um, the slides that um, show you the typical setback shape, the kind of pyramidal um, step to ziggurat that was so characteristic of um, the 1920s because of the zoning law of 1916, um, you can see how in design terms it played out um, in the kind of ascending pile, a kind of fortress-like or maybe castle-like um, architecture of Gothic and OG arches that you can see in the loggia at the top floor here. Um, looking out from uh, one of these common rooms at the top of the building at the Ritz, um, at the Ritz Hotel, which uh, was also a residence hotel and um, finished in just a, a few years before. Uh, so you can see this kind of almost fantasy land, almost romantic castle, it strikes me, um, in the architecture of the Barbizon. Uh, you can see it in the, uh, the revival styles, the kind of Romanesque or, or Near Eastern style and the detailing of the architecture. Uh, that is probably more historical than it is modernistic art deco. And in some of the rooms where there are both hints of history uh, and uh, lots of romance, uh, and um, also a, a little bit of a, a clue of a, a modernistic sensibility. Uh, and uh, in the floor plans, which are too small to read, but in, these, in the very top floors, you can see that these are common communal rooms. Uh, and the Barbizon fits into this history of hotel residential architecture uh, that um, was really pioneered on the Upper East Side by this hotel, the Shelton, uh, on 51st and, and Lexington. So um, just a little farther south than the, than the Barbizon. And um, you can see in the masonry character of the, the, the economical brick um, of the of the Shelton uh, and the, the solidity of the walls with these really very small windows um, that lit individual rooms because these were um, small apartments, either studio apartments or, or single rooms in the Shelton. And they were occupied by artists like George O'Keefe, um, who was draw, who was painting the uh, kind of monumental, massive sculptural forms of the uh, of Art Deco or early modernist New York and paintings like this one, um, or the um, next one, which is indeed from her window at the Shelton, as she named some series, as did her, um, her lover and then husband, Alfred Stieglitz, the photographer, who also took photographs of the, uh, the rising skyscrapers of New York from their 30th floor apartment in the Shelton Hotel. So hotel architecture was a kind of site for the birth of modernism um, in New York in the 1920s. Uh, and Paulina is going to take us from the, the birth of the Barbizon um, and through some of these uh, decades of um, its, its, its role and its uh, kind of assertive position in the history of New York and especially the women's experience in New York. So Paulina. Great. Thank you so much. First of all, I want to thank the Skyscraper Museum and Carol of uh, organizing this. And definitely I would love to thank Andrea Barnett who will be in discussion with me. Um, I am going to do a short presentation. Um, I'm not used to doing a short presentation. Usually this is a 45 minute one. So I'm going to scale it down to 15 minutes. Um, I'm really glad that Carol started off with sort of an architectural tour. I am a mere historian, not an architectural historian. So in fact, I was thinking I need to take Carol on the road with me. Um, so let me start my presentation here. Okay. Hopefully you can all see this. So obviously I'm talking about the Barbizon Hotel in my book, The Barbizon, the Hotel that Set Women Free. And as I say, I'm going to give you a very cursory uh, look into this hotel 
and then Andrea and I will talk further about it and then we'll have questions and answers too, which I hope you participate in because I do enjoy that part of every talk. So, oh, why is this? There we go. Um, just to give you a sense sort of, of that look and feel of the hotel, um, this is a matchbook, of course, from the Barbizon. And importantly, it's sort of its tagline was New York's most exclusive residence for young women. And it was on Lexington and 63rd Street. Um, here it is, as you can see, a very different kind of a 63rd Street at the time. And I did, I, I found it fascinating. And for many of you, this might be old news, but for me, it was very interesting to discover as I was starting the research on the Barbizon that the Barbizon was not unique in a way. It was not unique when I mean, it, when I say that, what I mean is that in the 1920s, a whole bevy of women's hotels were going up in New York. And this was obviously a response to social changes, to the end of World War I, the women's vote, thousands of women now coming into the city to look for jobs, to look for independent lives. And they, want, they were seen as, they saw themselves as modern women. And they wanted to have the same kind of living accommodations as men had. And, and for decades, men had these residential hotels, which as Carol pointed out, catered to people who were transitory, but also catered to people who were going to stay there for, for, for months, sometimes years. And so the same uh, hotel developers, in the case of the Barbizon, it was William Silk, wanted to obviously make some money from this and they started to build these hotels. And these hotels for women, they were full before they were even built. That was how great the demand was. What I found really interesting as well is that each one um, catered to a particular type of woman, client, potential clientele. So for example, there was a hotel that was built for business women, obviously somewhat older women. In the case of the Barbizon, the hotel was built for young women who were interested in pursuing the arts. And this is very clearly not just stated in this brochure, as you can see from 1936, but it was also built into the building itself. So as the building was going up in 1927, opening its doors in 1928, um, as that was happening, so there were also music studios that were installed, performance spaces, art studios. Um, and of course, this being the 1920s and sort of the emphasis on the women who can do what the men can do. The idea was to also have lecture series and also the ability to work out. There was a gym and a famous swimming pool right here. You can see the swimming pool. And what was important um, was that this was a hotel where men were not allowed beyond the lobby. We do have a photo here of, I'm presuming a father um, having lunch with his daughter. And there were times where you could take up somebody to the roof uh, restaurant when the roof restaurant was open and you could lunch or dine there certainly, but otherwise no men were allowed. And this was important because in a sense, freedom liberation through much of the 20th century for any young women came hand in hand with respectability. If you had respectability, you actually had more freedom. And so of course, men not being allowed past the lobby was very important in that sense. And I'll just very briefly say something about, um, this was of course, one of those typical, um, back in the day, those typical postcards that were left in hotel desks for visitors to write on in a sort of a form of advertising the right home about um, their experience, their vacation. And I have to say, everyone I spoke to um, who had stayed at the Barbizon said, this room looks nothing like the actual rooms that we were in. And in fact, many of them wrote that on the back of the card. Um, this room, I would say, is four times the size of the actual rooms, which was so tiny. Uh, just the other day, someone was telling me that the beds were smaller than twin beds. Uh, you would switch off the light switch by just throwing something at it from your bed. And we'll also talk a little bit more um, about this famous lobby, um, and we'll, we'll get to that in a second. So as I said, it was built in 1927 and its doors opened in 1928, but of course a year later is the Great Crash and the Great Depression begins. 
And so this really changes the hotel. As you can see, the hotel, well, you'll see if you read my book, um, the hotel was intended for a particular type of woman. Often, this was not stated out loud, but its location obviously was a hotel of whiteness, without a doubt, of course, it's the 1920s. Um, but, and it was of course for women pursuing the arts, but it was also at the beginning, sort of these elite uh, women's college clubs were housing themselves there. They had rooms for their alum, alumna and so forth. So it had a certain veneer of a sort of middle upper class or elite clientele. But the depression came and this elite clientele, many of them were now down, you know, down on their luck and they had to make a living for themselves, often also for their families. And this is when the Barbizon, in terms of what was behind its facade, because its facade figuratively and literally did not change for many, many decades, but behind that facade was now women who maybe were of that kind, but now actually had to work. And so you see, the proliferation of, of certain types of women now in the hotel in the 1930s. One was the Gibbs girls, the Catherine Gibbs secretarial students, and the young women who'd gone to Barnard and Radcliffe and Vassar and Smith and so forth, they were now clamoring to do a secretarial certificate at Gibbs. And Gibbs took over two floors and then three floors of the hotel as its New York dormitory. Another uh, resident you see now, starting in the 1930s, are the Powers Girls. Uh, John Powers started the first uh, modeling agency in the United States. And again, this, this need for women to find jobs that are deemed feminine and therefore not off limits to them during the Great Depression, when that feeling is that it is men who should have the scarce jobs. Um, here we have um, Oscar Beck, who was a famous doorman um of of the Barbizon and he was sort of guarding the women and particularly he became famous during the period of the hotel after the Great Depression starting in the 40s certainly going through the 1950s when the hotel was referred to as a doll's house obviously we have the young women the the Gibbs students with their hats and white gloves we have the powers models and we have lots of other women like that and so it starts to take on now this veneer of the glamorous. Um, what was interesting though, as much as that reputation, it really did try to maintain the reputation of being a place of a sort of elite uh, young women. What was interesting in doing the research, well, there are many interesting things, but, but one of them was that the socioeconomic differences were actually quite vast among the, the residents at, at the Barbizon. So for example, we have Grace Kelly, who arrived um, in the late 1940s. Um, but she became best friends with a woman next door, Carolyn Scott, who could not have been more different. Carolyn Scott was from rural Ohio, basically ran away from home to come to the Barbizon. She was able to get there because she won a beauty contest and got some money, ordered that money, collected more, got herself over there. A very common story among the residents of the Barbizon. And here we have the two of them at, at a gala of some kind. Um, and we have another shot of the lobby. Um, Carolyn Scott is actually up there. She's the one going like this. Um, and what is interesting about this, well, many interesting things, but we have sort of this Romeo and Juliet uh, mezzanine balcony. Uh, whether it was intentional or not, I really don't know. But of course it allowed for young women to look down to see other women's dates. They also would check out their own blind dates and accordingly either go hide or run away through the coffee shop um, or they would come down to meet their date. Um, also keep your eye, and well, I'll return to it very quickly, those two older, I, in my age, I hate to say they're older, but they're supposed to be older uh, women sitting on that love seat, clearly gossiping. Um, Mademoiselle Magazine was really an entryway for women to get into the Barbizon. Um, and it also became an entryway for me to get into the Barbizon and to sort of rebuild it in a sense as a historian, because again, we can talk more about this, but um, when I went to the project, I thought, oh, wonderful, this is going to be so easy. Um, the New York Historical Archives, they have a, an archive of New York hotels. There'll be a folder. There was a folder and there was nothing in it basically. Um, and I discovered there are no real surviving sources. So this, this story, this history really had to be put together in various uh, ways. 
tangential ways, you could say, um, to, to build that back up. And so Mademoiselle was really key. And um, I hadn't realized, again, very surprising to me, that Mademoiselle magazine had been a real force through so much of the 20th century. It started in 1935. It became known not not just for fashion. Not it, again. Its tagline was "Magazine for Smart Young Women," so you could see its parallels, right, with the Barbizon Hotel. Um, but it became a real force in literature uh, for many reasons. Mostly, they couldn't afford um, established writers, so they became really good at picking out uh, the new writers. And, and Truman Capote um, published his first short story in there. So. Manazon Magazine, the reason it became a gateway into the Barbizon was because Betsy Talbot Blackwell, who was the editor in chief from 1935 to 1970, basically created this scheme, these guest edit, this guest editor program. And it was a competition where the creme de la creme of, of American college uh, female students wanted to win this contest. Um, the aspiring writers, aspiring artists, aspiring editors um, and so forth would apply. And, and if you won, if you were lucky enough to win, you would come to New York and stay at the Barbizon for the month of June and shadow the editors at Mademoiselle Magazine. It is because of that that Sylvia Plath stayed there in 1953 and 10 years later published her novel The Bell Jar, which is entirely based on her time there. It is why in 1955, a very young Joan Didion was there. 1958, Ali McGraw, who came in as an artist, her parents were bohemian artists, she thought she would be the same. And she was uh, sort of plucked out of that um, by Betsy Talbot Blackwell, put on the cover of the magazine. That was the start of her modeling and then acting career. 1964, the designer, Betsy Johnson, and actually 1956, and I think Andre and I are going to talk more about this, um, Barbara Chase, who went on to become a very famous artist and or sculptor and artist and writer. Now, obviously uh, you can see with this picture how times are a changing. So um, as I said, no men meant freedom and liberation because respectability meant that. By the 1960s, this was obviously being looked upon quite differently. You could see that contrast here with one of the older residents playing the organ in the performance room and uh, those 60s gals there sort of kind of uh, singing along. And 1977, somebody smoking, which would have been out of the question before, of course, and in slacks um, in the lobby. By 1981, the hotel realized with occupancy rates were just falling, um, the writer Meg Walter, she was the uh, in the last group of Mademoiselle guest editors in 1979. She wrote a beautiful piece about it and how uh, New York was looking like an episode of Kojak. And indeed, the Barbizon was too. There, were, there was a hole in the ceiling, water was dripping, everything looked run down. Occupancy rates were so low that the hotel said, okay, we have to bring men in. And in 1981, there was a sort of well-publicized raffle on Valentine's Day. And the first man, to, the man who won, got the, you know, got the keys and the first man to run officially, there were many unofficial, or so they said, um, but officially the first man to get past the lobby. After this, um, oh, I should say, and um, the women, now, the women were those two older residents you saw on the love seat. They were known as the women, even during Sylvia Plath's time. The hotel was a launching pad. You came to that hotel because you had the ambition, you'd come to New York and you were gonna make it. If you were still there, it meant two things. One, you hadn't made it, two, you hadn't gotten married. And so nobody wanted to be the women, the older residents. Um, now, after 81, as the men were let in, much to their annoyance, the hotel actually closed for renovations and it went through various renovations. Forgive these terrible pictures, I was only able to take them. Um, in the lobby of the condo building that is now the Barbizon 63. Um, and they have this big light over it. Um, but I want to give you a sense of sort of the renovation of the 90s and 2000s. Uh, what was amazing though, was that these women uh, hired a lawyer. It was discovered that their rooms were, were actually SROs. So they were in rent control rooms. And as the hotel renovated, 
it had to renovate around them. So uh, for these two decades, on most of the floors, if you opened a door, sort of the older Barbizon was behind it with the, with the rooms and the hallway bathrooms and the women. Um, it started with 150 women. There are four left today. Um, in the early 2000s, of course, as real estate started to shoot up, many of these hotel owners turned their hotels into condos. That is exactly what happened to the Barbizon. Uh, the women uh, were moved out to a different hotel. The, the hotel was completely gutted. We can talk a bit more about that. Uh, Ricky Gervais, the comedian actor, lives there today. You can see how different the lobby is, right? Um, and uh, But the women, they, they got their own floor. Um, and according to rent control laws, they, they remain there. They live there to this day uh, with daily maid service. So that is my very fast 15 minute um, presentation. I hope that wasn't uh, too, too fast. And I'd love to invite An Andrea to join me now. Uh, Andrea, you're going to turn your camera on. Andrea? Yes. OK, I'm just fiddling. Oh, oh. Right. She came, Hi. she left. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, that was actually quite remarkable that you could say so much in such a short time. <laughs> I, I'm very impressed. Also with pictures, um, many of the things in my notes actually uh, you've covered, but there's still lots to cover. Um, I wanted to thank, um, before we get started, thank Paulina. And this is, I love this book. It was just absolutely fascinating. And it's ultimately a social history of women, particularly women's ambition, which is which is fascinating. And also Carol for, for hosting us. Um, maybe you, because you didn't, maybe we should start with, tell us what, what inspired you to write this story about the Barbizon. Well, I, I mean, there's- the, Thank you for not the, including that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, well, I two things. Um, one, I really was fascinated by the scene in the bell jar where Sylvia Plath goes to, or rather Esther in the novel, she goes to the roof of the hotel that's called the Amazon and she throws all her clothes over the side of the hotel. Um, and that is her last day in New York. And she did indeed do that. And when one reads her letters home, particularly in the lead up to going to New York in, for June of 1953. She was clothing obsessed. Uh, she curated her wardrobe so carefully. She didn't have that much money, but she spent a lot of it on this wardrobe. So for, to, for her to have done this, it obviously had some meaning. And we do know she was having, this was really the start of a mental breakdown. Um, but it was very much, I think, triggered by my Mademoiselle and, and the Barbizon. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. And then I have to confess, there's the other side, which is if anybody's ever uh, been in New York, uh, lived in New York and try to find affordable housing, uh, you find yourself forever obsessed with looking for housing. <laughs> I certainly do. I can talk to anybody about real estate. Um, and so there's, there was something also to me really fascinating about a time and indeed, much of the 20th century where somebody could actually come to New York without knowing anybody and know where to stay and, and, and be able to sort of start their dreams, their hopes and so forth. And, and I thought that was very interesting because it's a New York hotel. It tells a story of a New York hotel, but it's also a very, it's an American hotel ultimately, I think, because so many of the residents were women from small town America. It was in many ways geared for them. So you did have Grace Kelly who, who was coming from Philadelphia and was, was her father was a self-made millionaire, certainly that, but then you did have the Carol Scotts who were coming from rural Ohio and, and the hotel catered to that. So I found that fascinating. As, as, as something also that we don't really have today. You know, one of the things that um, that scene in the bell jar where, where Sylvia Plath throws her clothes out the window, 
One of the things that really struck me that we, that we tend to forget is that women were, were, the prescriptions for what a woman looked like, how she comported herself, what she could do and what she couldn't do, were, were so strict. And you're, I love the fact that in your book, you, you outline, for instance, when Sylvia got there, she, she'd been told by the Mademoiselle editors, um, you know, what she should wear. She should wear a dark suit. She should have never wear white shoes, you know, you know, always wear a hat, never take your hat off in the subway. Actually, that was the Gibbs girls. But, but we forget how constrained, I mean, women were really, really regulated. And the fact that at the Barbizon, um, as you so eloquently write, they had, um, under the guise of, 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 of all of these, these, um, these rules and regulations, they were really quite free once they were inside. And there were classes, there were lectures, and, and, um, and women, I mean, we, we tend to forget how few things women could do. I, I, yeah. I remember when you say, before World War I, if a woman sat down at a bar by herself, it was assumed she was a prostitute. Um, if she lit a cigarette on Fifth Avenue, she could be arrested for smoking in public. And somehow the Barbizon became um, a place where women could, it was subversive in a way. Could you, yeah. could you just talk a little bit about how they came under the guise of all of these rules, but they had a freedom they'd never had? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's interesting what you say about also sitting at the bar because um, Malachi McCourt, Frank McCourt's uh, brother, the Frank McCourt being the author of Angela's Ashes, and Malachi McCourt, who is still alive, lives in New York, um, is a wonderful storyteller and writer. And he actually opened in the in the ni late 1950s. He opened the first. He says the first singles bar in New York, a block away from the Barbizon, mm, called perfect. Malachi's. <laughs> exactly called Malachi's, and. He, one of his principles was, and it very much catered to women who were at the Barbizon. And one of his principles was that if you came in there, you wouldn't be harassed. And women could come and sit at the bar by themselves. And when he started this, it, no, it, was, it wasn't done anywhere. And so he assumed this was actually some sort of law and he looked into it and he discovered it wasn't the case at all. So in fact, there was a point where a cop came by and wanted to find him. And he said, well, find it, find it then. What, what, what am I breaking? What law am I breaking? And of course there wasn't any. So it's interesting. There were literally laws about women, of course, not being able to have credit cards, not being able to have mortgages and so forth and so on. And then there were these unwritten laws, these unwritten rules right. and regulations. And so it, it is odd to talk about a place that was is in a way so restrictive for it to actually be offering freedom, but right. it was. And one of the things it's at, when it was being built, these residential hotels didn't have kitchens and they didn't have kitchens because it was a tax loophole. And, but the Barbizon management, they turned that sort of tax loophole into sort of a positive, a, a part of their agenda. And they would even have it in advertisements that they did not have kitchens. And that meant women would not be forced into the kitchen. They'd be not, would not be forced into their nurturing, caring roles. And they could focus on themselves and on their careers and on their lives. So it was interesting the way there were these sort of forms of as you say you know subversion and resistance while at the same time you can say well we're looking at you know a very conservative group of women in a very conservative place and I also wanted to add I just wanted to add about the about the fashion um it was also what what one forgets speaking of things we forget um how regional America was mm. um and so the reason that Betsy Talbot Blackwell said, okay, we're going to do this guest editor contest, but the, the young women have to stay at the Barbizon was because she was asking parents to sign off on their daughters arriving by plane, by train, by bus, often from the West Coast to by themselves to New York. And it was funny how, 
not only, of course, most of these women like Joan Didion had never been on a plane until she was on that plane heading to the Barbizon and Mademoiselle, um, but how snippety these women would get about their regional outfits. Somebody coming from Arizona, sort of, what is she wearing? What are those moccasins? Is that what they wear? But things were really, fashion was regional, expectations were regional. And somebody told me, one of, one of the residents, she said, you know, we really, we looked to Sylvia Plath and the other winners that summer who were from New England, because no matter what, New England was seen as the intellectual Mecca. New England, New York, the rest of us were subpar automatically. I, I didn't realize until reading your book, and I found this fascinating that, that the Mademoiselle, that Mademoiselle editors, uh, particularly Betsy Blackwell, but the advertisers, when um, they really made it sort of a way to, the guest editors were, were in a way um, pawns in, in that they, they came, but they, were, they had been told to um, report what was going on in their various universities all over the, uh, over the country and what was fashionable and what people should wear and what they should be reading and what they should be thinking. And so there was all this young intellectual blood that suddenly flooded into um, Mademoiselle for the summer. And that became what the standard was for all sort of provincial young women all over the country who read Mademoiselle. And it was a kind of brilliant marketing tech tactic yeah. but it was also interesting that those those guest editors who some of them were quite provincial they got to new york and under the cover of this place of propriety they actually had freedoms they had never imagined and they could go out to bars and they could go out and they had because because they had the cover that this is a very respectable place and so they became the mouthpiece for a whole new generation of of values, and it was it was really very revolutionary, as you write. And I hadn't realized that that Mademoiselle really was kind of a precursor to Ms. It was it was way ahead of its time. And and you know that, that that's a whole other aspect of the book that's that's fascinating. The Barbizon and the and Mademoiselle are are two places that end up being sort of revolutionary um, vehicles for women. Um, and, and yet and yet forgotten. I mean. Yeah. Mademoiselle, I have to say, I was shocked to discover its history because I remember Mademoiselle from the 1980s. And I just remember an awful sort of teen magazine, one of the worst. Yeah. It was just, it was a terrible rag. Yeah. It was horrible. So yeah. when I discovered this, I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked by its literary value. It's, you know, Rita Smith, Surly Abels. I mean, they were famous. There would be compilations of the best short stories in Mademoiselle and so forth. It was, it was really remarkable. And the, in the same way, one could say what is forgotten, um, as, I, as I mentioned uh, briefly in that, in that speed walk through the Barbizon, um, I, I was really, really shocked to discover how little there is about the Barbizon, how little it was preserved. And, I'm willing on the one hand to say, okay, well, these are the accidents of history. This hotel was renovated multiple times by multiple hoteliers after 1981. Um, and I can imagine somebody, just construction worker took file cabinet and threw it out onto, onto the street. And certainly Tony Monaco, who is the manager of Barbizon 63 and has been there for the past 25 years. So he knew the women. He's the one who knew them the best by far. Um, he salvaged a Barbizon sign, which is in his office, which has just been thrown out onto the street. So there is that, and we've all seen it, right? We've all scavenged. Um, <laughs> but, but there, there still is the question of, well, why wasn't it seen as worthy of preservation at any point, right? Even prior okay. to the construction workers throwing it out onto the sidewalk. And it, I think it really is the fact that this was a hotel for young women. And even though a lot of those re residents went on to become famous, it just was not seen as important. It was right. seen as frivolous. Right, it was it, it sort of somehow cultural history of women's um, development is, is always 
it isn't well recorded. It just isn't it's well not. documented. And this, it's such a challenge if you're trying to write these histories. Yeah. Well, we'll get into that. Oh, the other yep. other thing, yeah. No, but that's fascinating, as you say, that you know there was no there was no archival you know thought about what this place had been. Um, I, I thought it was interesting um, that you write that in Mademoiselle, one of the reasons they, they were really um, publishing some, some avant-garde cutting edge fiction um, by men as well as women. And um, one of the things about the guest editors was that they, because they were college students and they were most of them quite brilliant, it was a way to get stories for, for very little because the magazine couldn't pay well. But also the idea was that women would eventually, they might have a little fling as a secretary or model, but, but the goal was for a woman to be married and she should know what to talk about with men. And that meant being well-read. So they were publishing this um, very, very important American literature under the guise of educating women to be great company rather than to um, say women well, could be I would, I would correct that a little bit. I would correct that. Uh, Betsy Talbot Blackwell, when she started in 1935, she basically took over Mademoiselle magazine after the first issue bombed. And she said to the staff, these, we, our clientele, our readers rather, are sort of teenagers to early marrieds. So 16 to 25. And they've been in college reading Shakespeare and Chaucer and so forth. We can't give them rubbish. Mm, mm. So in fact, we have to give them real, and she banned sort of advice columns and all sorts of things like that, that you would normally expect to see in a magazine for 16 to 25 year olds. Right. With the idea that why would we get, why would we dumb it down when they've just finished college? Right, right, right. No, it's true. You, you, you make that point that, um, but that, that um, you didn't, that they, she wanted it to be not, not Vogue, not haute couture, but also not house, good housekeeping yep. with recipes yep. and advice that it needed to be rigorous and literary, um, which is, which is really interesting. Um, I'm always interested that when times get tough, um, the little, women are always forced back into the domestic sphere. They're, they're always told their job is, is to tend home and hearth and the, to rear their children, their opportunities shrink. And yet somehow the Barbizon became a kind of safe haven for the Gibbs girls, for, for uh, the Powers models, for, for the guest editors later. Um, well, no, I, I'm mainly talking about the depression mm -hmm. when having a job was um, was considered um, unpatriotic because it was taking a job away from a breadwinner. Yeah. And um, how was it that that somehow the Barbizon was able? Was it that there were so there was such a need for secretaries and that 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 sort of the corporate world was was still big enough that somehow these women escaped the censure that, or was it, or was it the Barbizon? Was the Barbizon somehow protecting them from the kind of... Um... Well, I, I think, yeah, absolutely. And I, and I do think so many of these hotels, they actually um, went bankrupt and did not survive the, the depression. Um, the Barbizon, of course, went bankrupt, went into foreclosure, but it managed to survive. And I think one of the reasons it survived was because it pivoted. And it was able to pivot, I think, precisely because it was aimed at young women. Mm -hmm. So you had these young women who had the ability to work and now, and, and they needed to work. I remember reading a VASA bulletin from the early 1930s and, and the, it was a, there was a call out to alum saying, you know, we have all these graduating seniors who really need jobs that they, they really, this is not some sort of uh, pet project. Um, if you have a job, please let us know so that we can pass that on and so forth. Um, and so the fact that there are these young women who wanted to work, needed to work, and here was a place for young women who wanted to work to stay, obviously made it really important in that moment. And it was a safe haven, I think, because the it was frowned upon obviously a bit less in New York, but generally in the United States, it was frowned upon 
to be a woman who was working because you were seen as taking a job away from men. And also men were given sort of these subsidies. They had places, unemployed men had places to stay, to sleep. They got the extra apples from the American farmers to sell on the streets. Women didn't get any of that. Um, and I should actually say, and I, I mentioned in the book that a lot of women had to resort to also selling themselves. Oh, I wish you had had because you know that's I did. I mentioned it, but I have to say <laughs> now, you know, one of the and we can talk about this later. But um, during the Q and A, one of the amazing things has been, and I had learning more about the Barbizon from readers now that the book is out. And I knew this was going to happen. I knew all the stories I wanted would come out after yeah. publication, so I braced myself for a year. As a result, it's been delightful. It's just been it's cherry on the cake. Uh, but this interesting, I do want to add this very interesting uh, thing. So I just reviewed uh, Debbie Applegate's uh, new biography of Madam uh, for the New York Times about a brothel owner from um, in New York from the 1920s, 1930s and so forth. And I couldn't find the citation in, in, in Applegate's book, but she 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 writes about she's a great researcher so i'm sure it's out there somewhere but she uh she mentions doesn't write about she mentions that um i think walter winchell made up a term for them debut tramps debutants oh. who needed who 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 were working in restaurants bars as showgirls and then started to realize they do a lot better as call girls and they were called debut tramps and According, apparently, this, this brothel owner, this madam, Polly Adler, she actually had debut tramps that worked for her at the Barbizon. And there was a phone number they would call, a call service to explain that they're going to be there from this time. Where should they meet? Obviously, they couldn't bring anybody uh, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so to further just, you know, as I say, I do have a sentence about that, but I, I hadn't realized this and I'm still not sure to what extent this, this is true. Right. But in the whole scope of it, it probably is right. precisely because of just looking at the situation of women who had expected so much from their lives and then lost everything right. and were expected now to make a living. Right, right. And it probably couldn't be talked about much um, no, and among this is, themselves. This is, again, this is a, no, absolutely yeah. not. You know, I had that when I was working on an earlier book about the 1920s and 1920s was, there was a lot, it was a lot like the 60s in that there was a lot of sexual liberation and free love and, and women were, were sleeping with, with companions. And I kept thinking, why isn't there the research about birth control, what they were doing? And certainly some women were getting pregnant. How is that? And, and only toward the end did I find out there was a, a woman doctor who was sort of an activist who was helping women who'd meet at a certain hotel in the village. And, and these women, it was illegal to, to talk about birth control. Even in this early 60s, one forgets that it was illegal in some states for in Massachusetts, I think it was illegal for a doctor to um, give birth control to a married woman. I mean, it was and so, but it was, it's exactly it was, yeah. Yeah, you had to pretend to be married. Yeah, right, right. So, so there's so many stories that you know are probably out there, but no one was talking about it. Even though when people got into trouble, you know, they were probably you know there was a kind of a women's network. So, it, I, I'm not it was, surprised yeah. that by what you say, um, yeah. and especially because. Um, which kind of dovetails into something else I, I thought we should talk about, which is there was there was enormous glamour and and visibility at the Barbizon. Um, so many beautiful women, models, and and secretaries, but there were also women who didn't quite find their way, and they ended up to be terribly lonely. So there was a kind of invisibility that you write about later when Gail Green came back to write a piece for the New York Post about women um, who w women who were living in the Barbizon, but were, were basically almost shut-ins. And, and that's the other side of the story that, because New York can be the most thrilling social place or it can be a very, very lonely place. Yeah, absolutely. The Barbizon at least was a safe place for those women, but- um, I'm, yeah, I'm so, talk, yeah. yeah, I'm so glad you're bringing this up because of course, um, everybody wants to focus on the famous glamorous women. And frankly, I find the other ones more interesting.
Yeah. Um, and so exactly, I talk about sort of the invisibility of these women who really, and it, it is all thanks, again, this whole question of how, how do you get these stories? How do you, you know, so much of the stories of birth control, well, we won't know about um, right. of prostitution because nobody wanted to talk about it and so forth. But in a sense, the reason I'm able to even write about these lone women is because as you say, Gail Green, who is there in 1955 with Joan Didion and who, <laughs> Gail Green, no, she was not exactly loved in the group. Um, and she comes back a couple of years later for the New York Post indeed to write about, it's actually a series of articles about women's residential hotels. So she also writes a little bit, and I don't talk about that as much about the YWCA and so forth. Um, but she obviously focuses on the Barbizon. She, um, she checks in, uh, pretending to the reader that she's actually never been there before, as if she's never met the doorman before, um, whom she knew, of course, very well. Um, but she, it's, it's a very sad series that she writes. And I find it almost sad also having sort of gotten to know her through her cohorts in 1955. And she was very ambitious, but she obviously didn't quite fit in. She didn't seem to care, but I think she did care. And, and she decides to sort of get to know these lone women. And she feels sort of, I think, and I, she identifies with them and is therefore also repulsed by them on some level. Mm -hmm. And I think she, she mirrors so much of society in her attitude to them. And right. the reason that the, that repulsion is that is, is because of the sell by date. Right. That this is really the moment in time, the 1950s, when it doesn't matter how talented you are, how ambitious you are, you will come to the Barbizon, you will make a name for yourself, you will be famous, but then you're still going to go and get married. Right. I forget what your statistic was, but it was something like, um, you know, 60% of women were married by age 19. And so you didn't have much time to set yourself up either. No, and these a, women obviously or, could have a little time, but we're right. really talking about by mid twenties. Right. You, right. you should be married. Right. Right. Um, and so that loneliness comes from not fitting the ideas of womanhood. I mean, from our perspective, a lot of these lone women, they should have been happy. Right. They were right. leading independent lives. They had jobs. Right. They had people around them, maybe not their best friends, but they could all, they'd meet in the coffee shop. They could, or they could right. just sit and read a book in the coffee shop and be left alone. Right. And there were, there were lectures and things for that. I mean, yeah. there was definitely. There was so much. And they were in New York, right? Yeah. But yes, one New York can be a lonely place, but I think all the more if, if, your entire sort of gender identity is, right. is tied up in how, when you're gonna get married, if you're gonna get married, and do you have what it takes, meaning right. physical appearance usually, to get married. So I talk about this invisibility and I just wanna sneak in there too. I mentioned Barbara Chase in, um, in the quick talk. Um, I talk about Barbara Chase in terms of invisibility as well because she is not somebody you would expect to have seen at the Barbizon in 1956. It was um, so radical, the, in fact, of Betsy. The, the last, yeah, the last yeah. thing Barbara Chase is invisible, by the way, yeah. I can assure you I love, of that. I love the fact that she called herself, what, the cat's meow? Yeah. Oh, and yeah. she still thinks she's the cat's meow, and she is the cat's meow. Um, so Barbara Chase is fascinating. So it was really important to me. I'm writing a history of a hotel that, of course, a white hotel, but it's a story of America, a story of New York, a story of women. I have to sort of think, well, when did the first black woman come there? And I knew from articles that international women of color sort of were there in the, the late 40s, early 50s, as it was gaining in its notoriety and, and fame. But this is America, this is about race. Therefore, who's the first African-American, who's the first black woman to be there, right? Again, not meaning the floodgates of diversity open, but it helps us to understand what that place looked like and what New York looked like. So um, I was going, so my only archival, truly archival source, not archival sort of materials I collected from individuals, but archival source um, 
was the the office memos and office sort of letters and and speeches of Betsy Talbot Blackwell that are housed in the University of Washington at Laramie. Laramie. Um, and I was going through these memos and sort of boring, boring office memos. And in 1956, suddenly there's this argument taking place between Betsy Talbot, Talbot Blackwell and the editorial staff versus the business side of Mademoiselle. And basically they were going through the contestants and who they're going to pick for June 1956. And there's this woman who's clearly a standout artist. She's also attractive and articulate and goes to Temple University and they want to bring her in, but she's black. And the, and the business side's going berserk saying this, you know, this will ruin us. The readers will go away. The clientele, the advertisers forget this. And Betsy Talbot Blackwell said, no, she's coming. Um, so I, I spoke to Barbara Chase who now lives in Milan and Paris and has a oh boy. amazing life. Um, and you can see her work at MoMA and the Met. Um, and she really, so Barbara Chase said she had no problems with the Barbizon. And that, that was the big debate also in the memos was, will the Barbizon even let her in? Like they had no idea because nobody who was a black American woman had stayed there before. She said she had no problem. They didn't tell her about the swimming pool but she had no problem. But also I think part of why she had no problem and Felicia Rashad, who was there 10 years later, hated it and felt very sort of very um, sort of racially sort of looked upon. Um, I think part of why Barbara Chase didn't feel that, one, she was sort of under the umbrella of Mademoiselle, which right. of course gave her protection she was with that group. Um, but on the other hand, it's just also she <laughs> was the cat's meow. I mean, she kind of, um, she did not see racism because it did not, it right. wasn't about her because she was too fabulous. Um, and so she was able to walk through these situations and the, the Barbizon and the Mademoiselle, it became a huge launching pad for her. She headed to Rome after that on American Academy scholarship. She stayed in Europe for a long time. Um, she gave me letters that she wrote home during that whole period. Beautiful. I, I could write a whole book about her. Beautiful letters that she wrote. Um, so it was it was a remarkable story. And, and, and it's really interesting just to imagine her there in 1956. And the other reason they didn't want her there is because every guest editor, exactly as you said, was there also sort of promoting their generation, promoting the magazine. And so they were photographed all over the magazine. At that point, no black woman had ever been photographed on the pages of a mainstream white magazine. And it would not happen for another six years. Yeah, I was just about to ask you how, I mean, she was obviously um, a standout, how, how much longer that it took before that was in any way normalized, if it exactly. is even now. Um, exactly. But so I see Carol, I have one other question and then we can open it up because it's so it's so interesting to me. You um, you do a great job of, of, of describing the, the lurking pre prejudice against ambitious, talented women and how these prejudices happen to dovetail with the red baiting that was rife during the McCarthy era. Somehow feminism and communism were conflated. And, and that just fascinated me that that was going on at Mademoiselle. It, it, and it, and it, it sort of echoed when I was um, writing about Rachel Carson and, um, in the, and, her, and Silent Spring, which came out in 1962. Um, and Rachel was this very different, ladylike, soft-spoken um, woman, very shy, who'd done enormous research talk to you know chemists and doctors and scientists and you know silent spring was documented with 60 pages of, of of footnotes when she said that pesticides there was an association with cancer and that um these pesticides were poison and that they um altered the genetic coding immediately the chemical companies um went on a kind of smear campaign and called her a communist and the fbi started started to um to investigate her. And I mean, this was still, this is even the long shout of McCarthyism was still going on in the early sixties. And the fact that this, you write about it in Mademoiselle, maybe just quickly tell people 
how, you know, because the because ambitious women were there was anyone who was outspoken was 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 an easy target for that. Absolutely. And I will just say very briefly, because it is seven o'clock. So yeah. um yeah, yeah. I, I will just say very exactly what you said, you know, ambitious women um was seen as more vulnerable to communism, mm. which is interesting. You you would yeah. think the other way around, right? Right. That 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 women who weren't as educated or as ambitious somehow were less resilient to the to the communist ideology. Um, one, of course, a lot of educated women were indeed on the political left. So that that was certainly that was certainly true. Uh, but that again was this idea that educated women were often, and single women and career women were were somehow because they weren't going along with the american story right they were rejecting. they were more susceptible to the other story right that right. the soviet story um but i could say so much more particularly since by the books have been on communism but I <laughs> stop right here yeah and and hand over to carol but i just want to say andrea this has been a delight you you're a wonderful conversationalist thank you so much oh i feel I, I i this was pure pleasure for me i i really thank you i there were so many things and i I've, I've certainly researched a lot about the particularly the 50s and 60s and there were so many um sort of breathtaking revelations in your book. I, I just loved oh, it. I, I hope the audience, everyone in the audience buys the book. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you for, for letting me part of being part of this. Thank you. Well, that seems to be the, the um, prompt for me to say, yes, absolutely buy this book <laughs> in the audience um, and who um, I hope will um, feel uh, com compelled to, uh, to learn more of the taste that you've both given us tonight. I actually, I have to, I'm, I'm going to take credit for, for knowing that the two of you would be- <laughs> You should uh, take credit, absolutely. Having experienced both, both of your, um, uh, both research uh, focuses, but also the kind of enthusiasm that, um, and passion that, that you both bring to your work. So um, I, I wanted to pose, a question that you know is probably our last. Um, um, I suggest that those in the audience who want to ask a question, buy the book, read it, and take that as the opportunity <laughs> to pose a specific question to either Paulina or, or to Andrea. Um, but it seems to me, An Andrea, um, that your work on Bohemians um, in uh, as a setting, whether it's in the twenties or or the fifties or the beatniks or, 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 or it kind of in whatever decade, the manifestation of free thinkers um, represent one kind of artistic definition of what New York is. Um, you know, I'm, the question is, is kind of what kind of urban space do they occupy? Um, and for Polina, the, the, the Barbizon does seem to be a, a kind of institution that allows um, a, perhaps a more conservatively oriented, um, whether culturally or by, by nurture and, and nature, a kind of, and, and now I'm really going to oversimplify, kind of Republican bastion, maybe <laughs> against the socialist uh, revolution. I'm not sure about that, but yes. <laughs> I'm wondering if, if this is if there's a Venn diagram here that where the where these overlap in you know in either of your experience or research. Paulina, you wanna? Um, I I would say I mean I I was always struck by the fact that the as I say the you know the press coverage has focused on on the the famous glamorous women who became famous um, and writers and so forth. Um, I, I was really impressed by women who just got themselves to the hotel. Like just simply um, that in itself is, is for many generations and in many decades is such an act of resistance in and of itself that it doesn't matter whether you, you fail or you succeed. Um, and I, I felt like Andrea's you know, women have have some of that too. You know, I it it's a really Carol, it's a really interesting observation because uh, as I was reading um, Paulina's book, I was thinking about the women in Greenwich Village um, who 
people like Edna St. Vincent Millay and people who, who came and they were um, living in cold water flats. It was very, very cheap and there was absolutely no structure. And so there were, um, there was great freedom, but there was also a lot of them kind of crashed and burned. There was a lot of alcoholism. There were, there was no support system. And, um, and there were, there were, you know, a certain amount of them, but I, I think something about the, the Barbizon that was interesting to me was to see that with just a little bit of a support system, a community and some community activities, at least in Paulina's book, there weren't many um, women who went off the rails. And, um, and when I started my book about 20s Greenwich Village in Harlem, there were every single story was fascinating, but really, really tragic. Um, and, um, and so I think, I think that the Bohemian sector had a lot, I mean, a lot of them didn't have any way, they, there was no hope for a job. They didn't really have, a lot of them didn't have skills. They really had set out to invent themselves as artists. And um, it was a hot, that was a hard road. And, um, and a lot of them didn't succeed or they did succeed, but then only for a little while. But it's interesting that the city um, still, it was city was, New York City was the place they wanted to come, um, whether it was uptown or downtown. And um, I'm sure some of those Barbizon women also went down to the village. Um, they did. <laughs> they yeah. did. Yeah. yeah. But they, they, you know, I, they maybe came from, from more respectable families who, who, you know, were, were more strict with, with what they were, where they could live. Um, um, most of, most of a, a lot of the women who were in Greenwich Village um, didn't have much of a um, home life that, you know, they'd really escaped the provinces. Yeah. Well, I think it's um, by way of concluding and thank you you both for your contributions tonight, but also your your um, contributions as writers and and as um, subject shapers of of this material um, through through your academic careers and your, your writing careers. Um, but to connect to the skyscraper museum in the sense that architecture and the city is um, the the kind of material that we want to focus on and, and celebrate and appreciate as, as creating a, a kind of stage for human ambition of, um, a, of a sense of safety of all the things that architecture can actually do. But Lena, I think what you do, do in, the, in the Barbizon is, is to really show us how the architecture of the city is a kind of sanctuary um, and, uh, and also an opportunity for people. Um, so in, in this case, women, and as you situate the, the women's um, kind of grand central terminal of, of careerism that where, where there's this kind of social mixer, it was really, it was the architecture that made it possible to find, for them to find uh, a kind of safe haven in order to express their in, their. In and if I could just say, Carol, I thought it was fascinating when you were showing the the photos of of the Barbizon, and you would, and you directly spoke about how it had this look of a castle, of a fairy tale. Castle, I caught that too. A romantic setting. That's mm -hmm. why I said I need to take you on the road, Carol, because um, <laughs> you you really touched on something there. I have to admit that I haven't thought about that much. Um, and yeah, because it was yeah. a place for dreams, a yes, crucible for dreams. Yes, exactly. And it it was it it didn't it was built to already to accommodate that. So it, it wasn't an accident. The same way the studios were built in, the, the music and art studios and the performance space and the big massive organ was there. The same way as those those romantic, the romantic setting, the you know, the castle-like atmosphere that was built in. And so I just want to say thank you for pointing that out. I will be borrowing that from now on. It's all there on yours. <laughs> yeah. I think it is true also what you say about the fact that New York, the, the architecture has been a real crucible for creativity and for different kinds of lives that couldn't be lived in small town America. And that's what New York has always had to offer. And it keeps evolving. I mean, that's one of the things that's so interesting. It, it's a, it's different with each generation, but it it continues to be that. And so, thank you both for for making that point that um, architecture 
gives us a place to occupy the city and the city is what generates the the dreams and the ambitions um, to to act in so um, so thanks Polina and thank you Andrea this has really been fun tonight um, so for all of the the, the women of all of the decades uh, right on <laughs> <laughs> For all of our listeners, um, please come back for something entirely different um, in a couple of weeks because we'll be looking at construction history um, and especially uh, the construction of skyscrapers um, and the, the building industry of construction management with Brian Bowen, who has brought together an enormous amount of material in his academic life and in, in his practice um, to this um, surprisingly little studied area of construction history. So, um, so we have many topics um, at the Skyscraper Museum and we're really delighted that um, the women's study and women's lives in the city could be our focus for this evening. So thanks, Polina. Thanks, uh, um, Andrea. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.